Hello and welcome to this newest episode of History with Jackson. Today we will be looking at one of England's most infamous kings, Richard II. As always, we will look at who he was, what his early life was like, what his reign was like, his death, and then bring that all together to make a judgment on whether he was a good king or not. Today's episode is sponsored by The Historian's Magazine. The Historian's Magazine is a great place for you to go and check out a load of historical articles about a wide variety of things. All the links for you to go and connect and learn about The Historian's Magazine is in the description below. So thank you very much to The Historian's Magazine for sponsoring this episode. So who was Richard II? Richard II was born on the 6th of January 1367 in Bordeaux in the English county of Aquitaine. He was born to Edward the Black Prince and Joan Countess of Kent. He grew to be around six foot tall and he apparently was a beautiful man with a well-rounded white face, kind of alluding to the fact that he might have been more feminine than masculine within their interpretation of what a man should look like or a king should look like at that point. He was apparently well-read and intelligent, but he was not a warrior like his father and his father before him, but he did enjoy hunting. So what was Richard's early life like? Now, Richard was born in Bordeaux in, like we just said, 1367, as his father was running English lands in France from Bordeaux in Aquitaine. When Richard was born, he was never supposed to inherit the throne. His elder brother, Edward of Angleterre, was supposed to inherit the throne from his own father, Edward the Black Prince, who was going to inherit the throne from his father, Edward III. However, Edward of Angleterre passed away when he was five, so Richard became second in line for the throne. However, as we looked last week, Edward the Black Prince predeceased his father. This made Richard the heir to the throne when he was nine. And when he was nine, his grandfather very quickly invested him in his father's titles to ensure that John of Gaunt could not usurp the throne or usurp the claim to the throne from Richard. And the following year, when Richard was ten, Edward III passed away, leaving Richard, the 10-year-old, as King of England. So what was Edward's reign like? Now, on the 16th of July 1377, Richard was crowned at Westminster Abbey, and he became Richard II in the process. However, his ascension to the throne posed several questions to major nobles of the time. The previous minority had not been entirely successful. And the nobles were keen to keep power out of John of Gaunt's hands, as they had some unfounded beliefs that John was after the throne. So the alternative was a council of 12 men who would rule through Richard in his household. And they decided to declare a degree of competency for Richard so that this could happen. The beginning of Richard's reign saw an escalation in tensions with France. England had previously been attempting for peace with the French, but the French saw that the death of the Black Prince and the death of Edward and John of Gaunt's unsuccessful attempts in France gave them the upper hand and they attempted to gain a peace which was far more favourable to the French than the English. This led to any attempt at peace falling flat, and the Council of Twelve tried to fight back the French, but this was ultimately unsuccessful, and John of Gaunt came to power in 1380. Now, in 1380... John of Gaunt attempted to raise a poll tax to pay off the debts of war that had happened for the previous three years 
and to continue the war with the French. But this led to one of the most disastrous moments in English history and led to the Peasants' Revolt in 1381. The Peasants' Revolt started in the spring of 1381 and it is thought that it started in Kent and Essex from the unfair burden that the poll tax paced, paced, pardon me. The Peasants' Revolt started in the spring of 1381 in Kent and Essex and it is thought that it started due to the unfair burden that the poll tax placed on the peasantry. It was led by Watt Tyler and John Bull and the revolt spread across the country. The revolt led by Watt Tyler marched from Kent to London and they sacked and pillaged villages on the way. Their goal was the abolition of serfdom and the dispersion of land to the common people. Once the revolt got to London, the rebels burnt John of Gaunt's Savoy Palace and set up kangaroo courts to execute London councilmen and so-called criminals. Richard, at this point, was trapped in the Tower of London, but he agreed to meet the rebels at Mile End. At Mile End, Richard acquiesced to the rebels' demands, giving in to their wish for the abolition of serfdom and gave them free reign for them to hunt down the so-called traitors to the king. The rebels, with their free reign, executed two of the king's councillors and Richard and the rest of the men in the Tower of London fled to another safe space. The Tower of London then fell to the rebels. After the fall of the Tower of London, a period of mindless violence fell upon London. And eventually, Richard agreed to meet Watt Tyler and the rebels. At this meeting, Watt Tyler and Richard maturely negotiated through the rebels' grievances. But Watt Tyler offended the king as he spat at Richard's feet. One of the king's councillors took this as a personal insult to the king and stabbed Watt Tyler in the side. And as he attempted to escape, he died in front of the rebels. An all-out battle was about to happen, but Richard rode towards the rebels and quelled their anger. And he led them out of the city, ending the rebellion. This was Richard's coming of age. He demonstrated that he could, could, could act as a king, he could act maturely and that he could lead the people. And after this revolt, Richard showed the anger of a Plantagenet king, but also the ability to lead as he tore up the royal pardons that he had issued to the, rebel the rebellion and he punished the leaders that he'd get his hand on. He also told the rebels that the abolition of serfdom would not go ahead, although it did kind of phase out throughout this period. These were strong actions for a 14-year-old, but they began Richard's personal rule. Richard then arranged to marry Anne of Bohemia, and this was an important first move from Richard as it secured a political alliance. It also showed England's position in the Western Schism as he agreed to marry a princess of a country that supported the Rome papacy over the Avignon papacy. But this marriage was not one that was favourable to England as Richard had to pay £15,000 to Bohemia to secure the alliance. Richard, like many Plantagenet kings, began to rely upon favourites, and one of these favourites was Richard de Ver. Richard's reliance upon favourites in his earlier reign pushed away and angered older nobles such as John of Gaunt and his other uncles. 
and it also isolated these nobles in their actions to advise the king. At this point, England's fortunes on the continent were also waning, as her holdings in France had been reduced to Calais and a slither of land in Gascony. Now, the older nobles wanted to invade France again and reclaim English lands. But Parliament refused to raise any more taxes due to the consequences of the last taxes that led to the Peasants' Revolt. So to appease the older nobles, Richard led a campaign to Scotland. This campaign was a disaster. He further isolated and angered the older nobles by raising up and elevating his supporters into titles that did not match their background. The campaign was also a disaster as the Scots declined to meet the English in battle. So it was a pointless, expensive exercise that undermined Richard's position. In 1086, the Wonderful Parliament was called. This Parliament forced reforms upon Richard as they felt that he was becoming tyrannical. They expelled and exiled his favourites, and a group of five lords, the Lords Appellant, took control of England. They ruled on behalf of Richard, with Richard as a figurehead. These lords forced the reforms through and dismantled Richard's systems of favourites. And by 1089, the Lords Appellant had succeeded in their goals, and Richard was allowed to rule again. The resumption of Richard's personal rule in 1389 led to a respectful, peaceful time in England. The nobles and Richard got along really well. Richard attempted peace in France and attempted successfully to gain overlordship over Ireland once again. However, in 1394, Anne of Bohemia passed away and Richard's grasp on reality and his mental state started to descend. In 1397, Richard's mental descent was clear for all to see as he turned on his allies, former enemies, the Lord of Pellants, and had the Earls of Gloucester, Warwick and Arundel arrested. The arrest and future execution of these lords led England to fall to Richard's tyranny and he filled Parliament with Ricardian loyalists. And there were only two Lord Appellants left for Richard to deal with. The two nobles left from the Lord Appellant were the Earl of Norfolk, who was Mowbray, and the Earl of Derby, Henry Bolingbroke, who was the son of John of Gaunt. Now, in the period of peace between the nobles and Richard, John of Gaunt had returned to England. Richard had given him the Duchy of Lancaster and the Duchy of Aquitaine, so that he would support him in his goals to centralise his power and his goals of peace in France. Now, Henry Bolingbroke accused the Earl of Norfolk of treasonous actions and it was agreed that there would be a trial by battle between the two nobles. And just before the battle was about to begin, Richard decided to exile both of the Lords. Henry Bolingbroke was exiled for six to ten years and the Earl of Norfolk was exiled for life. Now England was truly in the hands of Richard and it was truly in his hands of tyranny. With all five Lord Appellants out of the picture, Richard began to flagrantly break the Magna Carta. He also began to charge any noble that stepped out of line with treason. This was a period of tyranny that England and the nobles were under. Now, in 1399, John of Gaunt passed away, and his heir, Henry Bolingbroke, was in Paris, in the court of the French king. Richard could think of nothing worse than the richest 
duchy in the land falling to one of his greatest enemies. So he annulled Henry Bolingbroke's claim to these lands. He annulled his inheritance. Henry Bolingbroke was angered by Richard's decision to take his father's lands as his own. And Henry contacted Richard's enemies and set up a plan to invade England to claim his inheritance. And in June 1399, Richard went to Ireland. He was aware that an invasion was imminent, so took with him the crown, the coronation regalia and Henry Bolingbroke's son. And at the end of that same month, Henry Bolingbroke landed at Ravenspur to claim his to claim his inheritance. The country then peacefully fell to Henry Bolingbroke and attempts to raise a royalist army failed as barons defected to support Henry. When Richard returned from Ireland and landed in Wales, he had no support to back him up. Henry and Richard eventually met and it was agreed that Henry would help Richard rule. However, Richard became Henry's prisoner in various different castles. And on September the 29th, 1399, Richard was forced to resign his throne. And Henry claimed the throne himself the following day. So how did Richard die? Now, Henry had agreed to let Richard live. He obviously was not in favour of regicide when he took the throne. But in 1400, Henry caught wind of an attempt to remove him from the throne and replace him with Richard. And it was decided that the threat that Richard posed was too much. And there was an order issued to starve Richard to death. And in around February 1400, Richard passed away. So was Richard II a bad king? Now, Richard was a narcissist and it is clear for us to see today. And in my opinion, Richard was a bad king. But I feel that Dan Jones in his book The Plantagenets perfectly encapsulates what Richard was like as a king. Dan Jones believes that Richard had the worst traits of some of the kings before him and that like Edward the Confessor, he focused on divinity over dynasty. Like Henry III, he focused on holy rituals over conquest. He had the tyranny of King John and he demonstrated the treachery and stubbornness of Edward II and that he focused on prestige over leadership. So yes, it is very clear that Richard was a bad king. So thank you very much for watching this episode, guys. And as always, I'm going to recommend some books that I found incredibly helpful. So firstly was Gwyn's Kings and Queens, the Indispensable History of England and Her Monarchs. Uh, you guys should know this one. I've now recommended it pretty much every video. It really is fantastic sailing guide to the English mon monarchy. Secondly, as a book I just mentioned, is Dan Jones's The Plantagenets. He really has a way with writing history and teaching history through his words. So I'd thoroughly recommend Dan Jones's The Plantagenets. And thirdly, is Simon Sharman's The History of Britain. I just think it's a great book. It's really well written. It has pictures and graphs. Um, and it does have a BBC show that accompanies it. So I'd recommend all three of those books. Now, thank you for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. And if you would like to keep up with everything History of Jackson related, all the links to my social medias are in the description below. Or you can head to my website, which is www historywithjackson.co.uk. On there, you can find the collection of my podcasts, my videos, and my work, my articles, and the blog. So head over to historyofjackson.co.uk if you want to check some of those out. And if you have enjoyed this video or podcast, please leave a like, a review, or a rating. 
below. It really helps us grow and develop to reach more people. So thank you very much for watching and listening. And I'll see you guys next week where we are discussing and learning about Henry Bolingbroke, Henry IV. So thank you very much, guys, for listening.